Okay, uh, we'll be starting and you are live now. Good afternoon and welcome to season two of Power BI Lunch and Learn. Uh, we are now on the World Tour stop number three and today we're in Australia. Um, today we've got a special guest in Warren Dean who will be doing uh, his talk on which way to write map. Uh, as you can see on the uh, slide, uh, he'll be talking through uh, how, have you ever got a lack latitude and longitude and thought, should I use arches or standard map? How about a map box, maybe maybe a, maybe a filled shape map? Join Warren as I learn the maps to choose the right story. Then we'll be following up with part two with Chev Raymond, who'll be doing not row level security. Um, just do a quick go through of slides. First of all, if you've missed some of season one or season two so far, all the episodes can be found at powerbisupport.co.uk. So take a moment to write that down. That's powerbisupport.co.uk. You can also access the blog, which features um, stuff from Lewis, Sheb and Ben, some great content then there, and also access to all the data, data sets they've used throughout the nine episodes so far. Um, uh, today's agenda, as I said, uh, after my intro, Warren will be talking about which way to write map, and then Sheb will follow up with uh, um, not row level security at one, not 12.30, apologies there. Uh, and then just talking through our, our trio of um, Power BI support guys, we've got Lewis Holmes, who's the BI uh, certified contractor with 10 years experience. Uh, we've got Ben Howard, who's the experienced one of the three, 25 years in consultancy, Power BI experience um, trainer and proud project trainer, uh, and very highly recommended, who has spoken at conferences all around the world. And then we've got our um, producer, uh, whose hair is a bit different now, Sheb Raymond. Uh, he's got over 10 years experience as a trainer, architect and BI specialist. Again, uh, I've known him for many years. Um, before we kick off with Warren, um, tomorrow night Power BI News Group is back. We've got two fantastic speakers. We've got Benny DeJager uh, with Troubleshooting Power BI Performance Report, Power BI Report Performance, sorry. And then we've got Alexander Arvidsson with Building an Empire, Inventing Power BI Step by Step. So if you want to attend that six o'clock tomorrow night, it will be recorded in Teams so you can play back at your own leisure. But if you want to RSVP, it's meetup.com, PBIMCR. I will now hand you back to Sheb, who will in turn introduce our special guest, Warren. Hi, Sheb. Hi, everyone. Thanks, uh, Alex. It's uh, good to have you back. Uh, we had a lot of people uh, commenting last week saying that we <laughs> affected one half of um, the Ant and Deck uh, duo uh, that you failed to show. Um, the Q&A is going crazy for you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, we're, we're glad to have you back. Um, hi everyone, uh, hope you're well. Uh, thanks for joining us here on episode three of the World Tour. Uh, now I'm sure you'll agree it's been a fantastic journey so far. We've had some great talks uh, from India. Uh, last week we were in Spain, this time we're in Australia and we've got three more jumps to go over the next three weeks as well. Uh, but let's focus on this week. Who have we got this week? Uh, well, we've got uh, someone who um, is the king of maps in, in, in my in my eyes. Um, now, this guy, he's been in government. He's worked in Power BI and BI and data for the last 15 years. Uh, he's a mapping expert. He's uh, he's organised and ran meetups over in Australia. Um, he's worked for local governments, uh, city of Casey over in, in Melbourne, Australia. Um, he's a data scientist. Uh, he's part of, of an award-winning team. Um, you know, I could go on and on, uh, but without further ado, uh, let me introduce you to Mr. Uh, Warren Dean. Uh, Warren, hi, how are you? Hey, good, Sheb. Good day, mate. How's it going? Good, good. How are you? Good, good. Excellent. Very good down under. <laughs> well, can we just confirm what time it is there? Because some of the people, that, that, you know, you want to make sure it's live. Yeah, no, uh, so it's 9.30, not in the morning. It's 9.30 p.m. here. <laughs> pitch, pitch black yeah. outside. Yeah. Uh, you're lucky I'm not in my pajamas, but I, I dressed up. <laughs> well, we're not going to test that. Uh, <laughs> right now, so, so that's good. Uh, well, being from Australia, you know, I would have expected you were into cricket, but you're more into your football rather than your cricket, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, no, I, f I follow the Premier League. Um, you know, I get up very well. I don't get up. I stay up to watch watch the Gunners lose. Um, so I've been waiting a few months to to wait to <laughs> to watch the Gunners lose again. Um, yeah, I stayed up to like two o'clock and, and watched them lose to to Brighton. So um, yeah, no, I love watching the Premier League. 
Um, we, we have uh, AFL. I'm not sure if you have a, heard of AFL down here. It's quite big in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, so that's another sport that we like to watch. Good, good. Right. Well, you've been in you've been in sort of government for 15 years. Um, I guess you know what, what are the sort of challenges you get, um, you know, in terms of data and, and, and reporting with with government uh, sort of projects. Yeah. So I mean, the last well, I'm I'm working my own business now, but um, two months ago when I was still working in local government, local government's really interesting because. Uh, you know, it's so many different aspects of what they do in government, so many services they provide to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, all those services have different systems, different data sets. Um, and my role was to, as a centralized resource, uh, look at all those different data sets, help those businesses who have no expertise in data, um, mm -hmm. their service providers, yeah. and help them make better decisions um, for the community. Um, so it's quite quite an interesting job. and. Um, in, in the slides, I'll, I'll show you one of my the favorite maps that I made when I was at the city of Casey. Yeah, excellent. Right, well, let's not waste any more time. If you'd like to share your screen, then uh, we can get cracking with your uh, with your presentation. Um, so I'm about to hand over, ladies and gentlemen, um, presenting which way uh, to the right map is Mr. Uh, Warren Dean. And I will show you your desktop. And you are ready to go. Cool, so you can see my screen. All right, um, so welcome to my presentation, which way to the best map. Um, I'm Warren Dean, founder at Datatail. Um, we work pretty much specializing in government in Power BI training and consulting. Um, you can feel free to check out my website there, datatail.com.au. Um, if you haven't connected with me on LinkedIn, um, please connect. Try to post some interesting things regarding Power BI, but also government, open relay, open data, and those type of things. Um, you can also feel free to check out uh, my website. Um, I have a blog. I'm pretty lazy at blogging, but but when I when I get it happening, um, there's quite a few blogs there. Um, and I do have downloads where you can download the file yourself. This is my, my COVID-19 report. You can download that and have a play with it yourself. Um, there's also a gallery on there for a whole heap of, I love maps, so obviously that's why I'm talking about maps, but there's a whole heap of maps there, LinkedIn things. So feel free to check out my website afterwards if you're interested. Um, but for today's presentation, we're gonna be looking at maps and which map do you choose when you're in Power BI? Um, you've got a latitude and a longitude and you just throw it into the standard Power BI map and, and away you go. I just want to kind of expose you to the many options that you have. Um, there's so much out there. Hopefully today in, in this 25 minutes, I can just expose you to the many different things you can do. So my goal really is to have a comparison between ArcGIS, Mapbox and Power BI. Um, so you've got your standard map, you've got your ArcGIS and Mapbox, which is a, a custom one. Uh, and uh, Warren, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Um, yeah, just, uh, if you just want to sort of minimize that little video in the corner, uh, just to give yourself the full screen. Oh, you don't, you don't want to look at yourself? Not really, I don't think everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and so my presentation, I haven't done in, in PowerPoint, so hopefully it's all in Power BI, so hopefully it doesn't crash. Um, but anyway, we'll see how we go. So the agenda and what we're going to look at in this presentation. So I'm going to take you through kind of five main features of a map in Power BI. So first we'll, we'll look at a circle map, then we'll look at a cluster map, uh, we'll look at a heat map, we'll look at a shape map, and then we'll look at base map, which is the, the base level of a map. And we'll compare them all against ArcGIS, Mapbox, um, the standard Power BI map. And I will give my assessment and just kind of expose you to what you can do in a map. So the first one we're going to look at is the circle. Um, so as the presentation goes along, you'll see we'll have, so the first one here will be the Power BI map, then we'll have the ArcGIS map, and then we'll have Mapbox. Um, now straight away, oh, actually, I'll just so the data that we're using here, I'm using data from Melbourne, um, where I'm from, Victoria, uh, and we're looking at crash stats um, across the state. So this is an open data set. Um, so there is 8,000 
points, latitude and longitudes. And you can see straight away in the Power BI map, uh, there's a whole heap of space where in the other maps it isn't. Um, so there are limitations on the map. So I suppose your first consideration is how many points do I have in a map? Um, and that's already going to make your decision easy. So if you have over three and a half thousand points, um, you can't go the Power BI map. You can see here that it's only going to do 3,500, 3, then it's going to stop. Uh, ArcGIS is, is a lot better. You can get 10,000 points. Uh, Mapbox is going to get you right up to 30,000, which, which is a limit for points in maps in Power BI. Uh, if we have a look at, so we have geocoding as well. So I'm just going to select the Power BI map. Um, so you can use a location, if I zoom in there. Um, so I'm using latitude and longitudes for the circle. Um, you can have, have a location as well. Um, so if you have a street address, um, all these maps are capable of do, doing geocoding. Um, so Power BI map will send it off to Bing, geocode that address and put it for you. Um, there's obviously limitations on how many points it can do. If you have a latitude and longitude, it's always better and faster to use a, a latitude and longitude. Uh, so if we have a look at the Power BI map, um, so there's a few things that you can do with a circle. Um, so one of the one of the reasons I do like the, the Power BI map, if I can get that to hover, is you can use custom tooltips, um, especially when I'm working um, for councils, you know, if, if these were assets and I want to see what that actual an image of that point. Um, you can use custom tooltips and use like the HTML viewer or something to put it within your tooltip, um, and which is quite a good way to look at it. You can't do that in ArcGIS or Mapbox. Um, so that's one advantage of, of the standard map. Um, it's pretty limited in, in what you can do. So you can change the colors, you can change the size, so here I have bigger circles where a, a more severe accident. Um, you can add a legend. Um, so if I take LGA, so that LGA is local government area. Oop. Oh, sorry, dropped it in the wrong one. Into legend. Um, it can have different colors. So you can see it's kind of these are different local government areas. So it's, it's, it's not bad. Um, ArcGIS is a little bit better, obviously, because you can do more points. Um, if ever you want to customize an ArcGIS map, um, it isn't actually in here. You'll notice in the format, there's, there's not anything that you can really do here. Your options are all in here. Actually, I'll just expand this one. So if I click on edit up in here, um, this is the options for ArcGIS, so it's a little bit different to all your other standard visuals. Um, and so in here, we can set the colors. Um, so if we get map theme, um, so I'm just using that simple style. Um, so I can set, you know, if I want a square or a diamond. Uh, what I do really like about ArcGIS is these color ramps. Um, so these are in maps or in GIS world. You know, these are kind of standard colors that you would use on a map to understand the, the gradient or the difference between points. Um, and you can set that at the moment, it's only a max of three. So, but if I had more points, I could set the limit on where I want the colors to change and I can set the classes. So it's a lot more customizable than the Power BI map. Um, so Power BI map, I gave it a score of three. ArcGIS, I'm giving it a score of four. Uh, Mapbox, I'm giving it also a score of four. Um, I'll expand that one. Um, so Mapbox, you know, it's, it's a little bit cleaner as, as we zoom in and out. Um, it has a whole heap more options. So if I open circle, um, I can set the radius size. I can set the zoom factor. So when do I want the circles to appear or disappear? Um, there's a lot of color options here. You can see when I hover over something, I can see it actually changes color. Um, ArcGIS does this as well, but I can set the colors so I can have a different color. Um, and what you'll find as we're going through the presentation, Mapbox always seems to have a lot more features in what I can do. So I've set the outside of the circles to a, a little bit of an orange to make it a little bit interesting and stand out. 
The, the one issue I do have with Mapbox, and if you can see in the top left here, is even though I'm hovering over many circles, it only actually shows three in the tooltip. So there's a lot more than three circles when I'm hovering there. So that's not so great. Um, you can see when I do the same in ArcGIS, you know, uh, 369 actual points. I can't really click on them and go through them, but at least I know there's a lot more than three points when I'm hovering over a circle. So I've given Mapbox a score of four for circle. Um, and the reason I didn't give it a five is because of this bug. Um, so what we can do is if I just want to look at one point on a map, um, so I'm just going in the filter pane and I'm going to select one point. And when it zooms in in Mapbox, you can see there's no point. The point disappears. We can see the point here. Um, and if I zoomed in in ArcG ArcGIS, it is there. Um, but if I go on two points, you can see they're there. But as soon as I go down to one, it disappears. Um, yep, this is a known bug by Mapbox, and it is in the in the list of fixes. But when when I built a product, this was this is really annoying because people want to zoom down to one actual point, um, and then it just disappears. So a little bit of a bug, and that's why I haven't given Mapbox five stars. Uh, the last one I'll show you for the circle, which is one of my favorite features in Mapbox. I'll just open this one up. Um, is this lasso feature. Um, so let's say, and when I was working in local government, I, I used this to identify areas in home-based care. Um, and we looked for kind of clusters of dots, I'm just trying to find a kind of cluster of dots, and yeah, maybe these ones here near Bendigo. And I could take the lasso tool and I can click on it and I can go, I'm just interested in these points. And then it, it selects just those points. And you can imagine, I've only got maps here, but if you had other charts and visuals, if you had just a table, um, it shows you all those points and gives you information about it. Um, so the lasso tool is really good when you want to get on a map and you want to understand an area. ArcGIS also has one, um, but it does it as a square. Get that. So you just got to grab it. Open up. Oh, it's freezing. Anyway, ArcGIS does it as a square. Um, when Mapbox has a nice lasso, so you can you know get into real areas, however you want to do it. So. For circle, I mean, choices you have there, obviously a few options, um, but I've given Mapbox and ArcGIS four stars. Let's move on to the next one, which is the cluster map. So you can't actually do a cluster map in Power BI. So, sorry, Power BI is zero, zero stars out of five for you, but ArcGIS and Mapbox, you can do it. Um, let's just have a look at ArcGIS first. Cluster map's really good if you have like heaps of circles, even if, uh, as you could see before, that was probably too many circles to display on a map to have any meaning. Um, a cluster, um, you've probably used them on a web page before where you can zoom in to certain areas. And as you zoom in, the clusters get smaller and smaller. Um, but I can see that, you know, maybe there's some larger clusters over here. ArcGIS is pretty limited in Power BI and what we can do with a cluster. Um, you can see when I go into the options, uh, in the map theme, um, I can pick clustering, and that and that's it. That's that's as far as I can go. So it kind of clusters by size, and it all it does is do it by distance. Um, I can't actually even set the distance that I want to do it. So um, it's okay, um, but I would definitely recommend if you're doing clusters to use Mapbox over ArcGIS. Um, I'll just expand the Mapbox one. Um, so in Mapbox, um, you can see it's even a little bit smoother as, as we're scrolling in and out. Um, but I can actually set how many clusters I want. So here I've actually got quite a lot of clusters. Um, the options in Mapbox is just huge. So I can go to the cluster. Um, I can even do it on account, sum, ag uh, average. Um, I can set the radius. So how far do I want my cluster. So here I've got 50. Um, if we go to maybe 10, 
And if I zoom in, you can see now, you know, I'm getting a lot more clusters because I've got a smaller radius. So that's all controllable within Mapbox. Um, colors you can do in, in ArcGIS as well, but um, the size, the radius. So as always with Mapbox, there's, there's a whole heap of options depending on how fancy you want to get in your map. Um, so the winner for this one uh, is definitely Mapbox, um, depending on what you want to do. Um, well, it's way too many, but obviously it, it's all customizable. Next one I'm going to show you is the heat map. Everyone loves a good heat map. Just let that load. Actually, before I before I jump into that one, I wanted to show you. I forgot this map to explain, so I I told Sheb I was going to explain my my favorite map that I created when I was at the city of Casey. Um, it is a heat map, so I'll just show that one there. Um, this this is a heat map that I created, um, and so what we have here is the heat is actually kin, um, children in maternal child health care. So I'm not sure if it's it's the same there, but in Australia, in local government, you know, when a baby's born, they visit a maternal child health. Um, they have all the details of that baby in the home address. Um, and as a local council, they would have that information. And that heat is what you're seeing on this map. So you can see, and in the city of Casey, between here and here is actually a growth corridor. Um, and you can see a lot of heat, um, a lot of young families moving in. It's it's a well semi affordable housing. Um, so what I did was I've, I've put all this um, children under four in heat, and all these little houses are kindergartens. Um, and I took this to the kindergarten team and I said, you know, have have you ever seen anything like this? And you know, obviously the kindergarten team they don't really work in data analytics. Um, but I said to them, how do you know? you know, when a kindergarten is too full and you need to build another kindergarten. And they said the only way they know that is when people, the kindergartens come to them and say our enrollments are full. Um, and I said to them, did you know using the data that we have, because we have another database of maternal child health data, I can actually tell you in four years time where you need to put your next kindergarten. Um, and I don't know if you can see it by looking at this map, um, but you can see right here, you know, this is where you need to put a kindergarten in four years time because you can see this massive cluster of children and their closest kindergarten that they're going to have to travel to is up here in four years time when it's time for them to go to kinder. And if you also think of it in the reverse way, um, this is actually an aging population up here and you can see a kindergarten here, which we probably should look at repurposing because there's no children being born in this area. Um, maybe we can use that facility for, for something else. Um, so sorry, that should have been in my introduction, but you know, the, the power of maps and actually spatially plotting things out to help people make decisions, um, especially in the government space, is, is just huge. Um, you know, you could look at all of this data in, in a table, but when you place it on a map, um, it's really easy to kind of force those decisions on. What is, what's something we should do um, in, re, in regards to planning for the future. So, sorry, back into heat maps. Um, so that heat map that you saw was Mapbox. Um, so Power BI does have a heat map. So if you do want to use the heat map in uh, the standard Power BI, I'll just expand that one. Sorry, I've got a lot of points in a map, so it's lagging a little bit. Um, so in the Power BI map, you can, so here's the options here. So you can set the radius. Um, so how, how far do I want the heat to go out? Um, you can set that by pixels or meters, and then you can set the transparency. So it's, it's a few options, it's not bad. Um, the problem I have is at this level, these settings work, but when I zoom in, all of a sudden that's not very helpful. And now I don't, I don't know where the hotspots is at all. Um, so when you're zooming in and out of the standard Power BI heat map, it's, it's not so great. 
Um, you don't have that issue with ArcGIS or Mapbox. Um, so Power BI Map, I've, I've given it three out of five. Uh, it's, it's okay. Um, ArcGIS, I'll just expand that one. It doesn't have the same problem with the zoom, um, but what it has is I can't control the heat. Um, I could go back into the edit options and show you, but there's no options here. It's not very customizable. So you can see, obviously there's a Melbourne, you know, it's a CBD, there's a lot of accidents there. And that's why we're just seeing this massive heat blob in Melbourne. Now, if I zoom in away from Melbourne, where there's majority of accidents, you know, it's starting to look a lot better now. Oh, so even Bendigo has a, has a lot of accidents. So now this is kind of looking a little bit better and I can see here's a bit of a cluster, um, but because Melbourne has such a high proportion of the 8,000 accidents, it's it's overpowering in its heat. So for this, for, for certain examples, it might work. Um, for this example that I'm showing you, it's not working very well at all. Um, I'm actually giving it two stars, which is maybe pretty low, but you know, I wanna be able to customize the experience for the end user. Um, so Mapbox, I'm actually giving um, five stars out of five. And the reason for that is, just wait for this one to open up. So now at Victoria level, um, this is looking pretty good. I can see it is CBD, but I'm still seeing heat even in the outer areas. And as I zoom, it doesn't matter to where, where I zoom to, if I zoom into this really hot spot, it kind of disperses as I get down to lower levels. Um, and you know, I can see, you can see these are all main roads going out. So I can kind of understand the patterns and I can see the heat, um, you know, as you would expect it to do. So I think definitely the best user experience is using the map box heat map. I'll just check my notes. So. Again, very highly customizable. Um, I can select the colors, the min and max. Um, actually, not that many colors. I would just recommend if you are using the Mapbox heat, heat map, default it is on like five or seven, which is just way too much. I always drop it down to like one. Yeah, you can, you can see what it does. So you, you, you need to play with the radius and bring it down to one and maybe the intensity to 0.5. Um, it might vary depending on how many points you've got. Um, so for me, the clear winner, if you're ever using a heat map, is to use Mapbox. All right, shape map. Shape maps are very cool. Um, obviously a shape, if, if you don't know what a shape map is, it's just a, it's not a latitude and longitude, it's a, a custom boundary that we can fill with color um, to identify trends. Um, so you can't do it with this Power BI map. Um, what you need is not this field map, but the shape map. Uh, you won't have the shape map there unless you turn it on. It is in preview. I'm not sure why it's lived in preview for months and months and months. I don't, I don't know when it's ever going to come out of preview, um, but if you do want to use it, it is in preview and it's not bad. I've, I've given it three stars. Um, it's it's quite nice and you know it's a little bit different because it doesn't have all the background clutter. So if you just want a map and I don't want to see everything else, I just want you know white space and I want a map. It's probably not the key feature of my report. I just want it maybe over the side. You know the shape map is great. Um, it has a few options. Um, so if we go into the shape, so it has some standard maps, but is again very limited. So in Australia, by default, I have states. Um, for you guys in the UK, you have countries. So you can imagine, not super helpful, especially when we're getting down you know, to lower areas, uh, but you can put a custom shape file in here. And that's what I've got here, Vic LJ Polygon is a custom shape file. And this is what I'm using here. So here we can see the count of accidents. Um, we can see this red area here, which is the city of Casey where I live. Um, I can use custom tooltips. You can't do custom tooltips in ArcGIS or Mapbox. So that, that's kind of nice. Um, so I've given this one three, three out of five stars because I think, you know, I think there's a lot of use cases for that. It's a little bit different, a little bit cleaner. Um, and definitely, you know, if you want something that's not the main feature of your report, um, you can use customized maps as well. So it's not bad and I'm giving it three out of five stars. The ArcGIS map, shape map. I'll just open this one up. Um, it's actually 
quite customizable in what we can do. Um, and what I actually love about this one, I actually use the ArcGIS probably the, probably the most sometimes. I'll, I'll explain why. But whenever I have a shape map, um, I don't really want to go and get a shape map and fix it all up and then insert it into here. It's, it's a lot of work. Um, the ArcGIS map has pre-built boundaries already in it. So it's all ready to go. There's hundreds of them. Um, so if I can give the example, you know, boundaries, one country here, I can pick Australia. Um, all these shapes are already in here. So I have postcodes, I have states of Australia, um, st st statistical areas refers to our census. Um, so there's a whole heap of in areas here. Um, and, you know, I don't have to bring this in manually and fiddle around with it. Um, it's already pre-built. So I love that, makes it easier for you. It's already pre-built for you there. Um, the color palette, again, is highly customizable. Um, I love, you know, this is kind of GIS standards. So having this kind of color ramp um, and being able to set the number of classes um, is quite customizable. You can't really do that in Mapbox. Um, so it is really good if you have, if I go back to the location, so if you have a type in here, so just see if the UK is in here so I can show you what's for the UK. United Kingdom. So you got countries, districts, postcode areas and regions. So if you have data that matches any of those location types, um, I'd probably recommend that you use ArcGIS because it's just a lot simpler um, to kind of drop that in. Uh, Mapbox, again, is kind of our, you know, Swiss Army knife of what we can do in a map. So it has, I suppose, the ultimate experience when working with a shape map. Um, so what can we do? So by default, it doesn't have a lot. So if I open, it's referred to as a chloropleth map. If I open up the chloropleth, um, so the colors are not like um, Mapbox. You know, it doesn't have um, the different, you know, setting 10. I can just have a minimum, median, and, and max. Um, the highlight color is quite nice, so I can see where I'm pointing over. Um, I won't play in this too much because I've, I've set it up so you can see it, but it does have um, default shapes, but it only has like three in America and two others. So it's, it's very limited. You need to be able to have a little bit of understanding what you're doing to use Mapbox. Um, so, you know, even the lines and things that we have between them. Um, so what I do love about this map, um, now if I hold control, I can set the extrusion. So I actually have a 3D map. Um, and so you can set the color by one thing and the extrusion, so how high it goes by another. And um, I think that's really cool that you can make 3D maps. And if you, if you wanted to make a 3D map, all I have to actually do is drop something in the size. So my color, I don't really have the appropriate data for it, but the color is the count of accident numbers. So obviously this is Melbourne, this dark blue, um, this is Casey, and then the size as well. So the height is another different way that you can measure it. Um, so it is kind of cool and you can you can move around the map and kind of set it at, at a layer that looks good. So usually I'll have it if I'm doing a 3D map, a bit like that, and people can use the map like that. Um, the other thing you can do is if you saw in here, you can have different layers. So if you've used drill downs before, you can do drill downs in a map box map uh, because I can have different levels here. So I can have level one and you won't see it, but level two. But if I now go down a level, so go down to the next hierarchy, no, oh, zoomed out when it zooms back in, um, I set up a few under levels here. So it can have many layers um, of shapes on top of each other, and you can actually drill down to the different layers. Um, so again, Mapbox, you know, highly customizable, and you can do a lot of cool things with Mapbox. Um, okay, that's it for this shape map. Next one we're going to look at is the base map. 
Um, and this is the last one that we'll do in the presentation. Um, so base map is actually what you put at the bottom. Um, so if we have a look at the Power BI map, um, you can see even with the standard Power BI map, you know, you can do some really nice satellite images and go right down to, you know, if I actually had dots and I had, had trees marked and we, we do that obviously in local council, we have all the trees uh, assets, you know, you could scroll down and have points on trees and go down to that level. Um, you can do that on all the maps. Um, so that's just the base map in Power BI. Um, ArcGIS, um, this new feature came out, I can't remember if it was last month or the month before, but um, bringing out layers. So you can actually have layers in a map, um, but it's not actually what you think it is. Um, I'll, I'll show you what it is, but it's not as if I can take um, data in Power BI and you know drop a latitude and long in one and drop a latitude and long in another one and have two different data sets on or two different data points on map. Uh, that's not actually what it's referring to as layers. Um, it's referring to data that sits within the ArcGIS server. So in Power BI world, not super helpful to us as of yet, I'm hoping one day we can put multiple layers on a map within Power BI natively, that would be awesome. Um, that would definitely be a game changer. Um, but what we can do in ArcGIS is use reference layers. So if I go into edit, and what I have here is a reference layer. So you can see these are the, so I've, I'm just narrowed down onto two local government areas. Um, my points are the same color, um, but there's a reference layer under this map um, and you can make your own uh, reference layers on ArcGIS online. Um, I think it's all free to do. Um, you can grab other reference layers. I'll just show you how to do that. So if you go in ArcGIS map, if you got reference layers, I actually never looked into this because when you when you click on reference layers, it just shows you everything American. I'm like, oh, no, no one wants to see American data. Um, I thought it wasn't so interesting, but if you click on this next one, which is ArcGIS, um, this takes you to publicly shared ArcGIS layers. Um, so uh, let's let's go to UK and see if anything comes up for the UK. Um, so people have made these layers. Um, you know, UK historic countries, Department of Trade, Police data. Um, all this type of layers, reference layers, you can actually put under your map. Um, you can, if you have a GIS background, you can make your own or get someone to make one for you. Um, location of airports, you know, that might be interesting if you have some data, if you're ever working with airports. Um, and you know, as I'm scrolling, there's just more and more and more reference layers, de demographics layers, qualifications. So here's some information from your census. Um, someone's already put it in there for you. All you have to do is select it, uh, go back and that's what I've done here and I have a Victorian one that's showing this is actually just showing local government areas in different colors um, so reference layers if you haven't played around with that um, that's that's quite cool and it's a way to make it appear as if you've got two layers of data but you don't actually it's just the base map and some points you've put on top um, so for ArcGIS I'm, I'm giving that one five out of five uh, Mapbox, I'm also giving it five out of five. It does it, but in a in a different way. Um, so in Mapbox, um, this is again the the example that I referenced in my introduction. Um, I can build my own custom base map. It's a little bit easier than ArcGIS. Um, and what you can do here is I've got schools, and I've got crashes. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll quickly flick over to Mapbox. How are we going for time, Sheb? I feel like I'm, I'm running running over your time. Uh, no, don't worry, uh, Warren, carry on. All right, um, so we've, we've got heat map um, and I've put a base map under it. So you can see, um, you know, we're looking at accidents and I've put little houses for schools so that I can identify where there are accidents near schools. And as I'm zooming in, you know, I can see maybe there's a couple here um, we can scroll around the map and try to see if there's any schools near accidents. Um, so I actually did use this in a project looking at school crossings and if there were accidents near school crossings. Um, and we actually found a lot that we didn't realize, you know, using Power BI and kind of being able to zoom in in a map, just trying to see if there's any obvious ones. 
it's nothing too bad. Anyway, obviously you understand the concept that, you know, I can put again points in a base map under a heat map to, yeah, maybe this one here, you can see, you know, to identify maybe this school um, is having a lot of accidents of cars coming down this road here. Um, and if ever you wanted to do that in Mapbox, it's quite simple. Um, you can build um, a layer and, and not even if you just wanted to have points. So what I've done there with the schools, that's just data from a CSV, latitude and longitude that I've put into a base map. Um, I did some work for a client and they wanted to just see um, parks and waterways. Um, so in Mapbox, when you build a map, you can just turn things on and off. Um, all these layers are already here, it's all, all pre-built. I just turned them all off except for parks and waterways. Um, and so you can have a really nice base map um, that's in line with the client that you're working with. Um, you know, I'm highlighting parks and waterways. I can have that as a, as a layer within Power BI. Um, so that's really cool. Um, so that is base map. I think that's the last point that I had. Base maps, just checking my notes. Yeah, awesome. All right. Um, so, so that's my conclusion. Um, thanks for, for watching. Um, again, there's my website. Um, if you are interested in Power BI with a kind of government twist or, you know, people who work in government or consulting government, um, I've just released my online training course. Um, you, you can check it out there, Power BI Training for Government, um, where we kind of build products from scratch with a kind of government lens, so solving problems that government have. Um, so uh, that's it for me, Sheb. Well, thank you very much, uh, Warren. That was a, a really good presentation. Really enjoyed that. I wanted you <laughs> to carry on for the full hour, actually. Um, but but no, that was a it was a very good presentation. We've got uh, quite a few um, questions in the Q and A. Um, so I'm just going to take over uh, the screen, and and if you want to take over the Q and A and answer the the number of questions that we've got coming in there. Um, so I'm going to quickly jump over um, and do a, a quick uh, presentation on some some role of security. Well, not role of security. Uh, data masking it is. Uh, there were a few uh, requests when we did our feedback form, etc., uh, to give uh, to do some more sort of talks on on security and and, and other bits and pieces. Um, so I thought this was quite a good uh, way. Uh, quite a good good trick that I'm going to sort of show you here on how we can uh, mask data without implementing uh, role level security uh, as a as a full concept. Right. Okay. So I'll start this presentation for you. Okay, a second. I'm not too big on presentations as you guys know, so uh, excuse the um, begin. There we go. Okay. So hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, not role level security, uh, data masking. Okay, uh, no, who am I? Okay, so what's the plan? So the scenario is that there's a sales director, okay, and he wants their salespeople to be able to log into Power BI, and he wants to them to be on only to be able to see their own data, right? So their own sales, their own profits, okay, but they also want them to see the sales and profits of other salespeople as well, and without showing exactly who it is. OK, so and this was and this needs to be implemented without roll up security, because if you implement roll up security, you just see that person's data. You don't see anybody else's data because it's filtered down to you. But we want to show almost like a, a comparison of where you are compared to other sales piece and with people without giving away their sort of identity. So if not role level security, then how? Okay, so data masking. So it's where you strate strategically hide uh, values based on certain criteria. In this case, it's going to be the logged in user. And it's the process of hiding sensitive data and uh, or personally identifiable uh, data in your in your reports. Uh, now, this particular solution that I'm going to show you now, it works when users have read only access to the report. So if they're editors, um, they can essentially sort of go into the report, download it and have a look in the background of the report, which sort of uh, goes against the, the security part of it. But this can then be coupled with RLS to make it a lot more secure. OK. Go to my okay. I'll go to my Power BI screen, mate. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's get straight into it. So this is going to be a blank um, 
uh, just a blank report that I'm starting with, with. So recent sources, let's just pull in this sales example. So this is just a basic sales data set um, all in one CSV. Uh, so I'm just going to pull this in. and I'm going to start this whole sort of process from scratch just to show you um, how straightforward it, it can be uh, to get in there. Okay, so we've got our data set over here. And we've got our salespeople here on the right hand side. Okay, so I'm just going to make some changes here. So I'm just going to replace a couple of salespeople. So I'm going to replace John with myself. So Okay, I want all John sales and I'll, I'll really replace all Stevens with mine as well because I want their sales. Okay, brilliant. So first things done, I've got my sales in there. So as a salesperson, I'm in uh, the report. Okay, so now I'm just going to add this column as a new query. So I want to create my uh, salesperson dimension. Uh, and I did this in sort of a, a different session um, last last season. Uh, but all we're doing here is getting a distinct list of the sales people by removing duplicates in here. So I can just call this name. So now you see I've got my mate Dave, Andy, Sheb, Matt and Alex in there. Okay, and that's my sort of distinct sales people. Now I'm going to add a, an index column. Okay, and I'm just going to rename that to ID. Okay, and then I'm going to create another column, uh, but this would be something, uh, so I'll call this principal name. Um, this is going to be like the, the, the user principal name function that you get, so it'll be your sort of uh, logging name uh, as such. So in this case, I'm going to put my PC name, so that's vector360 backslash, and then I'm going to add in my name like that. Okay. So then hopefully, oh, I need to put an ampersand in there. How many codes do we need to learn in here? DAX, Power Query, Encode. There we go. Okay, so now we've got our sort of login username, which, uh, which we can sort of pick up using um, uh, a sort of function. Okay. So salesperson, uh, I'm just going to rename this to sales. Okay. Now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to join this back onto the existing or the new table that I created. So I could bring through the ID, join salesperson onto the salesperson using the name. We should have all matching, which we have. Okay. I'm going to bring through the ID. From there, and then I'm going to remove salesperson. Okay. So put the ID in there, salesperson ID joins onto the salesperson ID in here, gives me the user. Okay, first step. Uh, so we've got our data, da da our salesperson dimension there, and we're going to start pulling this through. So we just want to see what sort of thing uh, we can get from here. Okay, so we've loaded in our date. Let's uh, get some basic data okay so I'm going to get my sales date go to my call on day for the time being and get my sales get my profit and then from the salesperson data I'm going to go and get name okay so at the moment we can see everybody there which is great okay and that's that's as we sort of expected because we haven't done anything with it Okay, now we're going to create a few measures now. So let's create a few measures. So let's create a, a username measure. Okay, now this will be the username that is going to pick up from uh, the session. So we're going to say username equals uh, user principal name. Okay. So if I drag this onto here, card visual, you can see that that's picked up my username there like that. Okay. So next thing, now let's do uh, another measure. Now we're gonna, what we're going to do here is just compare the logged in user against uh, the username that we've got uh, that we created in our uh, last step. So we're going to create a new measure here. Okay, and we're going to say, right, so who is the current user? So the current user is an if statement. So we're going to say if the sum of sales And the selected value of the principal name is 
equals to the user principal name. Then I want you to show the name. Which is going to be the selected value. And I'm going to type in name. Like that. So what this is doing is only showing the results where there's a transaction here. So this is what this part does. And then it's also looking at the principal name, comparing it to the logged in user to see if that's um, me or someone else. Okay, so now I'll take this table and I'll drag this value in. Okay, so now you can see that the current user, it's not giving me any values against anybody else other than myself here. Okay. So we've started the process now. So we've already picking up sort of the data that we want. So now we can sort of see, okay, well, we've got a breakdown of data here from Alex and Andy, but we can't see his details in the current logged in user. We can only see sort of mine there. Okay. So now we're getting down to the stage where we can filter it down and only show certain data. Okay. So the next step is to create like a masked name so this time we're going to create a new column so we're going to create a, a new column here based on id so we're going to call this uh, masked username okay. and this time we're going to say salesperson sp dash and then we're going to join that on that with the the random id that we create so we give it a, an index id didn't we in the, in the last session in the last step so we'll add that onto SP, which is salesperson. Okay. So if I add in the mask username in here now, so now I can see that I've masked that username with uh, a, another random sort of generated value there. Okay. So what's the next step? So we can now hide these names. So I've got the name here. So I can right click and I can hide that name because I don't need it. And I can remove that from here as well. So now I can only see my, but then I don't even need my current user in this um, because I'm in here like that. Okay, so now I've logged in here and I can see uh, my details. I can see other people's details. Um, but then again, you know, I don't know exactly, you know, who I am. So who, which one am I? Um, now we did see before when we added in uh, the current user is that I'm so on number three here. Okay, so let's just put a quick filter in at the top here, just to show the mask username. Okay, and if I select number three, then those will all be me and anybody else, all the other salespeople I can see, but I don't know who they are, but I can see their sort of figures and compare them to mine, right? So let's try and make some better use of this then. Okay, so let's, a new visual down here. And we get the master username. Okay. And I'm just going to grab the sales and put that in there. Okay, so I can see all the master usernames and I can see me, uh, number three, I'm way ahead of everyone else. Yeah. Okay, so let's create a couple more visuals just to compare. So what we can also do is then um, put in different categories as well, um, and we can break it down into other ways. Uh, so if we this down here, have a little trend. Move this out of the way, we don't need it. Okay, so let's break this down this time by category. Let's say, okay, well, let's break it down category and let's uh, bring in the sales, which we've already got. And we'll put it into a nice format like this, okay? The must username we put underneath, so when we drill down to the next level like this, we can click on me and see exactly sort of where I come in sort of respect of everyone else. Okay. A little trick down here, we can then combine the axes and say, okay, we'll turn that concatenate labels off and then sort this by category and must username. And then within each category, I can then see where I stand against all the other sort of salespeople there. Yeah. So what else can we do? So then let's create a, a little matrix. 
Let's so create a little matrix here and let's put in the order date as a value there. And let's put in the masked username into the columns. And then let's put the sales into the values there. Okay, so now I've got some visuals on myself against other salespeople. Um, and if I filter down to my myself, I can just see all my data throughout how I'm doing. And if I want to compare it against any of these others, I can chop and select those as well. OK. So, but, you know, what if you don't know who, who this person is, who SP3 is, and you don't want to sort of go down that process of, of, of sort of finding finding that out, you want you want your data to be clear. OK. So we can go a step further now and we can add in some sort of highlight or almost like background uh, colouring. OK, so what we can do over here, if we go to uh, here and create a new column. OK, I'm going to X out of that because I don't need a new column. I need a new measure. So I'm going to call this measure background color. Okay. And I'm going to say if not blank. And then I'm going to say the current user. Then I'm going to set that as pink. Otherwise, I'm going to set that as light grey. Okay. Something like that. So now if I go over to my my salesman username over here, I can go to my date colours. I can add in some conditional formatting. Okay. And then I'm going to go to my field value and I'm going to base this on background color, click OK, and that highlights me there. Okay, and I'm going to go over to this one, I'm going to do the same thing, and change color scale based on a field value, and click OK, and that's me. And then finally, I'm going to go into here, and then I'm going to go into sales, initial format, background color here, Based on the field value, background color, like that. So now I can see exactly where I am. Uh, I can see how I compare against everyone else. Okay, and I don't need to sort of select or figure out who I am. I know it's me because I'm the one that's highlighted in pink, and I'm the one who's making the most profit. I'm the one who's selling the most <laughs> throughout the the year. Um, so that's uh, a way of masking that data there. Okay. So now one thing I'm just going to change, I'm just going to show you one more thing here. Um, let me see who else I have got in my session. So if I go to my uh, table here, so you can see I've got my users, so I've got Matt. Okay, so if I change my user and I say, okay, I want to view this role as someone else. So I want to see it as Spectre-360. Slash Matt. Click OK. Now you'll see he's logged in and now the pink's changed and so sort of automatically moved over to him because now Matt's logged in. As you can see, his details have come up here. And now the sales review, we're looking at everyone's uh, data compared to Matt uh, and he can only see, uh, know who he is and doesn't know who anyone else is. OK, so that's a really simple way to apply data masking uh, to your report without role of security, gives you a bit of security, gives you a bit of um, comparisons and you can do a league table and other things as well uh, with that. And pretty much every sales company or sales department that I've worked with over the uh, number of years, you know, need something like this. So I'm hoping that you guys can make uh, some use out of that. OK. Right, uh, we're just coming to the end, so um, I'm going to finish this off. Um, this, these files are going to be available. Um, hopefully, uh, I'll speak to you 
uh, Warren, hopefully he'll be able to share his uh, his uh, slides and, and other things. If not, um, these will definitely be available on uh, Power BI support code at UK. Um, let's uh, start this. So go to my Power BI screen. Thank you. So this was the steps that we just went through. Uh, we've got the data, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and this all can be available to you as well. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, like I said, all content available on powerbisport.co.uk tomorrow, and the live link is available now. Uh, next week, <laughs> next week, people, uh, we are jetting off uh, to the the United States of America. We <laughs> now, I was excited for uh, Warren. Um, and I'm just as excited for, for this guy, uh, Greg Deckler. Uh, and if you don't know who this guy is, um, if you've ever been into the Power BI community and you've uh, submitted a question or wanted a question answering, it's highly likely that this is the guy who's answered your question, okay? This is the only guy on the planet who has earned 3,000 and 5,000 kudos on the Power BI community, and that's for helping people like us. And he's gonna be live with us next week on this uh, on this show so make sure uh, you do not uh, miss that okay um, I'm just gonna pass over to the guys so guys if you want to unmute and say bye to everyone uh, and then we can pass over to Alex to to, to close up uh, Warren thanks for uh, thanks for the session. Um, Alex, I'll pass over to you. Um, thanks a lot for attending, guys. Hopefully, we shall um, see you uh, again next week. Alex, you're on screen. Thank you very much to Cher and to Warren today. Two fantastic talks. I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, sorry, Alex, I've uh, accidentally muted you. <laughs> Apologies. Can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. OK, thank you very much to Cher and Warren. Two fantastic talks today. Really enjoyed uh, Warren's talk, especially around the map stuff. Uh, I think I'd be keen to, to get you involved. We're possibly doing a session with the, the Manchester user group um, in future. Uh, but going in, in reference to that, tomorrow night we are back with the user group. We've got two talks kicking up at 6 p.m. We've got Benny Jager and Alexander Arvidsson. Please sign up on the meeting if you haven't already. Uh, the Teams link's there, uh, so I look forward to seeing you then. But um, thank you very much for attending this lunchtime. Enjoy your rest of your day. Uh, and we will see you this time next week with our trip to America. Thank you very much. <laughs>